Yes, thank you very much for the invitation to do this. Um, for those who don't know me, um, so I'm, I'm Willem Muller. I'm at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Um, there I direct the Nano Medicine Laboratory, but also have a, a strategic position at the uh, Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam. Um, okay. All right. So <coughs> Mount, Mount Sinai has a beautiful location. So this is a picture of, the, of my group taken in Central Park. Um, and it was like a, a two-minute walk from where we uh, reside. So that, that's an advantage for sure. Um, um, yeah, I, I had to give it some thought, right? Because this is uh, educational. So I, I think I should do some type of teaching as well. And I tried to combine this with, uh, with actual applications. So, um, <laughs> The first part of this talk is about self-assembly and how you can exploit self-assembly to create aggregates of amphiphilic molecules that um, can be considered nanoparticles. Um, and then the second part of the talk, um, I'll discuss different nanoparticle platforms which are based on, uh, on uh, amphiphilic aggregation. Um, and they go up in complexity. And what I try to, will try to show you is that when you want to synthesize or produce these type of nanoparticles, the more complex they get, the, the more sophisticated and refined synthesis methods you need. So I'll integrate this in the talk. Um, so let's go to the, to the first part, so self-assembly. And uh, this is a cell membrane. Uh, I guess all of you know that a cell membrane is co composed of a phospholipid bilayer in which proteins are integrated. Um, and this is a typical structure that is uh, within your body that is um, based on self-assembly. Um, this is obviously not nano, but your body also has nanoparticles, inherent nanoparticles. Um, and these, this is, for example, the lipoproteins. So lipoproteins are little nanoparticles that travel throughout your body and they transport fat. Um, can go from the uh, liver and spleen and intestines to peripheral tissue and the other way around. In, in the field of atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease, the most famous lipoproteins are LDL, which is known as bad cholesterol because it contributes to uh, atherosclerosis. And then you have a smaller version, which is high-density lipoprotein, HDL, which is also known as good cholesterol. Anyway, th these are examples of how self-assembly also occurs in, in, in nature, uh, so within our bodies. So if you look at the architecture of a lipoprotein, it consists of a hydrophobic core and an amphiphilic coating. I'll get back to what amphiphilic is, in which amphiphatic apolipoproteins are embedded. So it's a structure that's solely based on self-assembly because of the properties of the molecules that form the aggregate. So how does this work? Um, yeah, so I have to go to basic chemistry. Maybe, maybe this is even high school chemistry, but um, it, all, um, it all starts with polarity of molecules. So famous example of a mole molecule that's very, um, that's very polar is water uh, because these, uh, this oxygen atom um, pulls harder, so this becomes a little bit negatively charged, pulls harder at the electrons, and the protons, this side of the molecule, becomes a little positively charged, so you have a polarity within the molecule. <coughs> this is a famous example of, a, of an apolar, or reasonably apolar solvent, which is chloroform. And here you see fatty acids, which also do have very little polarity. So this is water, so you could also refer to things that like to be in water as hydrophilic, and this is hydrophobic. So this also allows us to, uh, to build a model why oil and water don't mix. Um, because of these polarity of these water molecules, they can form so-called um, hydrogen bonds as electrostatic interaction, and since these uh, apolar molecules don't exhibit this feature, they don't tend to mix. And that's, that's typically what you see if you mix oil and water. <clears throat> so then you have also molecules that actually have both amphiphilic, um, or sorry, um, um, hydrophobic and hydrophilic features. And these are known as amphiphilic molecules. And we all know phospholipids. Phospholipids have a hydrophilic head group, and you have these hydrophobic tails. So these molecules are, they tend to like water 
on, on the head group side and they tend to repulse water or don't feel comfortable in water on the uh, tail side. And so there's a whole bunch, a range of phospholipids and, um, and they can form aggregates <laughs> upon exposure to aqueous surrounding. So what basically happens is that these type of molecules, so these amphiphilic molecules, they self-aggregate in, uh, in a manner that the in this case, the hydrophilic head groups are facing the water, and here the uh, hydrophobic tails are facing each other. And this is a, a micelle-like structure. And what you see here, they can also have a different type of organization. What you see here is a, uh, a bilayer. And so where the hydrophobic regions are facing each other and the hydrophilic head groups are facing water. Okay, so how can you exploit this? Um, this is, I think, a very nice example um, because what you see here is two very similar uh, molecules, at least that's what it looks like when you, at a first glimpse, but they're actually very different. So what, here, what you see here is ordinary phospholipid, it's DPPC, it has C16 tails, it's uh, saturated, um, the hydrophilic head group. Um, and then what is used in, especially in liposome technology a lot, is to have include phospholipids that are functionalized with polyethylene glycol, which is a hydrophilic uh, polymer. Um, and what happens is, and this, this is misleading because what you see here, so you have this unit repeated 45 times. And this is hydrophilic, so the hydrophilic part of this molecule is massive compared to the hydrophobic part. Okay, so now you can think, why does this matter? Well, it matters a lot because the hydrophilic fraction, which is basically the ratio between the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic part in the amphiphilic molecule, determines what structure will be formed. And so if the hydrophilic fraction is between 25 and 40 percent, you get a bilayer. If you go something where the hydrophilic part of this molecule is, uh, is very dominant, that's what you see. So you get these cone-shaped um, molecules and they tend to form micelles. Um, so if you go back here, if you use pure DPPC, you'll get a bilayer. If you use pure PEG DSPE with this large hydrophilic part, you get something, um, you get micell, <coughs> micelles and you can mix both and you can get structures that are in between like discs or ribbons or threads. Um, so that's, that's really important. If you're thinking of designing a nanoparticle based on amphiphiles, then you should really take, give a consideration of what molecules am I going to use, what properties do I want that nanoparticle to have. Okay, so, so this is some, some, some background, and I'll go to actual ex examples. Um, I'll start with liposomes, and I'll also try to integrate how you synthesize these liposomes, what the actual steps in the laboratory involve. Um, so, so liposomes are uh, phospholipid vesicles. Um, they can be unilamellar, or you see here, so they have one phospholipid bilayer, but they can also have multiple uh, uh, bilayers. Um, and the reason why these bilayers are really stable is because the, here you see a phospholipid bilayer, you see the acyl chains, um, and because of van der Waals interactions, van der Waals forces, these molecules interact and become very stable. Um, so depending on what type of molecules you use, so you can think of something that is very linear or something that's very flexible, you can actually influence the stability of a phospholipid bilayer in a liposome. And you can make it uh, de dependent on, on, on uh, temperature, you can um, make it dependent on, on pH, there's all kinds of tricks you can apply to influence the stability of a uh, phospholipid bilayer. And that can be useful for things like controlled release of, of drugs or uh, imaging agents. So here's the actual uh, uh, synthesis procedure, so what's the, the steps that are involved. Um, and yeah, I, I would consider this one of the m most simple, but uh, at the same time elegant ways to, to synthesize a nanoparticle. So what you basically do is you create a lipid film, you hydrate the lipid film, and then you get the formation of vesicles. Um, so this starts with lipids, usually available in powder form, and these lipids are dissolved 
in uh, organic solvents. It can be chloroformethanol, it can be ethanol, um, it can be DMSO. There's all kinds of s solvents that are suitable to do this. And where you, so this is the first part. And then the second part, you want to get rid of these solvents and create a nice thin lipid film. Um, yeah, I think. Okay, so this looks a little bit dirty. This one, uh, maybe it was not the best picture to show you guys, but should this, you should look at this picture and it's really clean. And that, that's how you should do it in your laboratory. But I'll talk to my people. Uh, um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, back to this lipid film. So we have a nice thin lipid film, and the next step is that you hydrate this lipid film. Um, that's this step, and I should go back maybe to this one. So you go from a lipid film, you hydrate this lipid film, um, and then you get this formation of, of, of multilaminary vesicles. And if you look at this, it's still a mess, right? So it doesn't look like you have nice uniform nanoparticles. Um, you see they're multilayered, they're, they're heavily um, diverse in size, um, and they're very poly dispersed. Um, so the next step is some type of method to size these nanoparticles. In, in case of liposomes, there's two popular methods. There's more methods uh, available, but there's two very popular methods. One is sonication, so the application of, uh, of ultrasound uh, to a sample. And that doesn't really allow you to control the size because it basically dictates that these particles become extremely large and also are so extremely small and, and not super stable. And the other method is through extrusion, where you basically, under high pressure, you push push these multilaminary vesicles through filters and in that way get a defined size. And this can range um, anywhere from, let's say, 80 nanometers up to 200 or maybe 400 nanometers in diameter. <coughs> um, so this is all we end up with, nice unilaminary vesicles of uniform size. Okay, so then I was like, looking a little bit into, into literature and, and Actually, I started doing a lot of liposome work when I was uh, uh, doing my graduate studies with, with class. Um, but I, was, I thought I should also educate you about, you know, what are the famous people in this field. And it's not only us, or maybe we're not even famous. But um, So, so one, of the, one of the guys that's done a lot is uh, Vladimir uh, Torchelin. Um, and he wrote a very nice review, and I recommend you to to read it because it's just in, it's interesting. But this I really like this one because this gets the evolution of the liposome technology. So in the 60s, liposomes were discovered, and they were really simple, or it was uh, bilayers, uh, bilayered vesicles, and um, people knew they could include hydrophilic agents inside the aqueous lumen of liposomes. Um, then Pagulation was introduced, that's what you see here, and the attachment of targeting ligands. Also, Terry Allen, she's, she's from uh, Canada, is also uh, known for this uh, pagulation technology. And it became more complex while this field evolved, so pagulation and the attachment of, for example, antibodies to make them target specific. And yeah, now you have you know, Christmas trees that have uh, uh, nucleotides, uh, uh, reporters, drugs, um, all kinds of things can be incorporated in liposomes. The thing you have to remember, liposomes can have a hydrophilic anterior, so that's an aqueous lumen, so it's mostly suitable for carrying uh, hydrophilic agents or materials. Um, yeah, I'll skip this. Yeah, there's all ways of, uh, there's all kinds of different interactions liposomes can have with a cell, so they they can, they can be taken up by endosomes, and they can release their drugs by some type of exchange mechanism with, with the cell membrane. Uh, they can fuse with the cell membrane. Um, there's, there's different ways depending on the composition of the liposome, depending on what you target, depending on the drug, that you can have these type of interactions that are summarized in this figure. Um, yeah, so I think also liposomes are most famous in terms of uh, clinical applicability. So there's a, this is from 2005, so probably this list is longer at the moment, but there's a lot of clinically approved liposomal, uh, especially cytostatic agents in, in the field of, uh, of, of therapy. 
Yeah, so, so then I went back. So, so liposomes are important in this field of molecular imaging, um, primarily in, in MRI because they can carry high payload of contrast generating materials, and that means that you can more sensitively detect uh, uh, certain epitopes of interest. And I would really like to credit this guy, he's called Mark Bertnarski. Uh, I think he passed away in 2006. It's very un unfortunate, but um, did, I really want you to uh, memorize this paper, because I looked up in Web of Science, it actually gets very little citations, and I was surprised to see this, um, because it's one of the first papers that shows the, uh, well, at least the applicability or the potential of paramagnetically labeled liposomes as MRI contrast agents. It's, it's very difficult to find, but it's a, it's a JAX paper, and um, I recommend you reading this. And following uh, that technology, um, we have some really uh, cool papers. So this is the this is the actual application um, as a as a long circulating contrast agent. But then in let me see in '98 uh, they were among the first to show that you can do uh, target specific molecular imaging with a with a with a nanoparticle contrast agent. Um, so th this is really a seminal paper, um, and a lot of work has followed since. So um, I, I, this is this is good stuff. Okay, so liposomes uh, are good as carriers for hydrophilic um, agents. Um, this is a very different platform, and I'll go back to one of the first slides uh, where you see that oil and water don't mix. The nice thing is when, this is not nice, but okay, oh, I forgot I put in this slide, but okay, so, um, so this is the oil in water. Um, and technology to, to kind of solubilize this oil is basically by adding uh, amphiphilic molecules. So molecules that are par partly hydrophobic, partly hydrophilic. Um, so they form these little oil droplets that can actually be removed and, um, and that's a way to get rid of oil spill. Um, you can do the same and create nanoparticles in a way like this. These are called oil and water emulsions. Depending on their size, you can refer to them as micro emulsions or nano emulsions. And what this basically is, is a oil droplet, so a hydrophobic interior that's covered by a monolayer of amphiphiles, where the hydrophobic regions of these amphiphiles faces the oil droplet, and the head groups faces the water. So this is a really nice way to solubilize little oil, oil, oil droplets. Um, yeah, I think the credits for exploiting this in the molecular imaging field should go out to uh, Greg Lanza and uh, Sam Wickline. Um, and if you do a PubMed search, Lanza Wickline, you find almost 100 papers. And uh, it's mostly about this, this nanoparticle platform. Um, we also became a little bit active in that area. Um, so before I uh, disclose these details, um, I, I want to like briefly show you the, the synthesis method uh, um, most people use to create oil and water emulsions, and that's through microfluidics. It's kind of a heavy device that pumps the um, reagents under high pressure to little uh, uh, microtubes, and then makes them collide under high, high pressure. Um, so you can find information. I mean, I don't, don't want to pretend like I want to help that company, but. Um, Anyway, so th this this is uh, the synthesis method of oil and water emulsions, and I think it's actually less complicated than the synthesis uh, methods of uh, of liposomes. So in 2009, we published technology which is also based on these oil and water emulsions. But the nice thing about uh, this technology is that we were able to control the size in very relevant size range. So we were able to s size down these nanoparticles down to something like 30 nanometers all the way up to 100 nanometers. Um, and since they have a core of soybean oil, hydrophobic materials, in this case hydrophobically coated nanocrystals, can be included in the core of these particles. And here you can see that um, the size with TEM with dynamic light scattering, and nice thing is if you look at nanoparticle samples, the smaller the sample, the less light they scatter, and the more transparent it looks. And then when you go up in size, it becomes more cloudy, more milky, and looks like, uh, like coffee. Yeah, so um, we're, um, uh, Anita Gianello will, will um, uh, uh, present a poster about this technology where she 
extended the technology and took it a step further and um, created uh, oil and water emulsions with a smart coating. So this particle has a coating that upon a, a, a response, in this case uh, uh, MMP2, can be cleaved and then targeting moiety becomes a, become available. And so this is a way to extend the technology and uh, create uh, what we refer to as smart nanoparticles. Yeah, something about high-density lipoproteins. So uh, HDL is, is also referred to as good cholesterol because it can transport fat from the arteries back to the, <coughs> to the liver. And what we've done is we looked at the architecture of uh, HDL. We can actually isolate HDL from uh, plasma and then label this. And this work has been initiated by, by Zai Fayat, who's the director of, of the institute I work at. And then uh, David Cormoy and, and I took it to the next level um, by creating um, what we refer to as nanocrystal core high density lipoprotein. So what we did here is the natural core of high density lipoprotein, which is tri triglycerides and uh, cholesterol esters, we replace that by a na diagnostically active nanocrystal. So um, here's something about the, the synthesis uh, of these nanoparticles. So we, we either purchase or synthesize um, nanocrystals that have hydrophobic, hydrophobic capping ligands, and then we, through a process of dripping this um, in a organic solvent into hot water, you get a mixture of micelles and nanocrystals that are coated with a micelle coating. And then if you incubate with apolipoprotein uh, A1, which is, uh, um, which is what makes this particle HDL, you get these type of particles. So actual HDL and HDL with a nanocrystal core, and then we apply separation techniques, and you end up with something that's very monodispersant size. You have these nanocrystals in the core and a nice lipid layer. Yeah, so we, you can include gold for CT imaging, iron oxide for uh, magnetic resonance imaging, quantum dots, and you can additionally also label the corona of the particles to make them multimodal. Here's some example in an APOE knockout mouse. So what you see here is the abdominal aorta um, that is thickened because of the uh, uh, formation of atherosclerotic plaques. And when you inject this nanoparticle, which has natural affinity for uh, atherosclerotic plaques, you can see that the vessel wall becomes enhanced. Yeah, so th this is some proof and evidence that these particles actually associate with macrophages, and that's our natural target. Okay, so we're now also exploiting this for targeted drug delivery, so we're including hydrophobic drugs. Um, where you can see that it targets the vessel wall. This is uh, ex vivo aorta, where you see where at regions where there's high uh, plaque activity, there's also a high nanoparticle uptake. And uh, with combining this with the drug, we could actually deplete the macrophage content in these atherosclerotic plaques in one week treatment. So we'll, on Saturday, there will be a talk on, on this specific uh, study. Yeah, and then um, something that David Cormode further developed. So in addition to HDL, which is relatively easy to uh, synthesize, we've been also started working on uh, LDL and label these lo low-density lipoprotein nanoparticles are freshly isolated from serum and put in nan nanocrystals and get something like this. Um, I won't disclose any details, but if you're interested, this I believe this will be a talk on, on Saturday on this topic. But it really shows you how you can... Uh, manipulate um, nanocrystals and mix them with uh, these lipoproteins and get something that looks like this. Um, yeah, so and then the last part, and I hope there will be a good transition uh, to the next talk. So uh, now we go to something that's more complex and that re also requires refined synthesis methods. And this is something, uh, this work from uh, the Langer lab. Um, and what they develop is these uh, microfluidics chips. And that's what you see here. This is a typical example of, of, of such a chip and has three inlets. Um, and by connecting these inlets via tubes to, um, to syringe pumps, you can um, control what you infuse in these inlets. And after you start um, infusing this, there will be a micro vortex 
It's, it's like a tiny, my, my, uh, tiny vortex where nanoparticle uh, uh, formation occurs. Um, and this very elegant technique, because uh, you can judiciously control the infusion rates, so that gives you a way to, uh, to control things like size and composition of the nanoparticles, and also allows you to create uh, uh, nanoparticle libraries. So here you see the schematically depicted, so you get this infusion of these different solvents, formation of, uh, of microvortices, and then the formation of nanoparticles. This does not um, require the, uh, uh, the application of heat, or uh, you don't have to sonicate, so there's no ultrasound required. Um, so it's, it's kind of a mild condition, so it allows you also to use complex molecules, uh, like uh, uh, peptides that are prone to, to be cleaved because of heat. So this, it's, it's very elegant. The other thing is that you can, you can produce uh, literally liters of nanoparticles using this technology. So uh, we applied this technology to create uh, complex lipid polymer hybrid nanoparticles. So then we go, we mix, basically this is a core of uh, PLGA, which is a, is a uh, biodegradable polymer, which is coated with uh, phospholipids and has um, gold nanoparticles included. Um, so how you can do this is use this microfluidic channel. You have to do a lot of tests to see what the exact conditions are to actually get something like this. But if you do it in the right way, you can get particles that look something like this. I, I have to be honest that these specific particles were not created with microfluidics. Um, but also on this topic, there will be a talk, I believe, that's in tomorrow's session, um, and that gives you a good sense of how to, how to create such complex nanoparticles. Uh, um, I think this is, this, will, this ends, ends my talk, and I, what I hope I've shown you is that by um, understanding the properties of amphiphilic molecules and polymers, and having the availability of different synthesis methods that you can actually uh, create complex materials, and you can also do it in a way um, that allows the, the scale up of these uh, of these nanoparticles. Um, yeah, then I'd like to acknowledge my lab, and if you're interested, uh, we have a Facebook page that you can uh, can browse and see what we're, uh, we're in, involved in. Thank you. <laughs>